Shares for beginners. Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. Even the smartest people in the room sometimes get it wrong, right? And that's the thing, because at the end of the day, they're still human. We're still sitting around that campfire four million years ago, looking out for the tiger out in the dark there. And whether you've got a Nobel laureate or you've run a bond desk for 20 years, at the end of the day, it all boils down to those raw emotions and particularly when it comes to investing it's fear and greed that are just you know tug of war all the time. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. You might think it's hard to hold your nerve when markets oscillate wildly but what is the true test of mental stamina? What happens to financial professionals when they're responsible for billions of dollars that can disappear at the stroke of a pen or the press of a button? I'm joined today by Simon Shepherd from the Investing Newsletter Group to recount a couple of war stories that he was privileged to live through. G'day, Simon. Hey, Phil. How are you going? Oh, good, mate. Thank you very much for coming on back on. A pleasure as always. So, Simon, we still have a passing familiarity with the global financial crisis, although it seems to be fading from memory. But hardly anyone remembers the LTCM collapse of 1998 which could have brought down global financial markets. Tell us a story and your part in it. It's a great point, Phil, and I don't know whether that shows the age of, of us or the age of the listeners or a bit of everything or probably just you know the recency bias of the human brain, right? But it was a big event at the time, the, the collapse of long-term capital management, also known as LTCM, and they were one of the sort of the preeminent hedge funds back in the day and interestingly set up by some very high-profile financial gurus at that time, including a former head of bond trading from Salomon Brothers, a guy called John Merriweather. And actually, I don't know if you've heard of, you know, Michael Lewis, who writes a few of those books on- The Big, the big Short, Short. Of Yeah. So mm-hmm. he wrote a book about five books ago, of which John Merriweather was one of the characters about days of the bond trading desk at Salomon Brothers in the 80s called Liars Poker. So anyway, John Merriweather was one of the founders of long-term capital management, but pretty prestigious board and high-profile names, including a couple of Nobel laureates, Myron Scholes and Robert Merton. So some real big hitters, right, in the finance world. So they set this fund up and thought they had this bulletproof strategy to effectively make risk-free money or arbitrage or whatever and invested in a whole bunch of different assets. And I, I suppose the thing that really killed them at the end was, A, the strategy didn't work, but mainly they just had extremely high levels of leverage. So in other words, using a very small amount of their capital or shareholders capital and borrowing stack loads from counterparties, mainly investment banks or commercial banks, whatever. And so as they got into trouble, the returns or the losses rather were amplified by that leverage. And so it reached a point in 1998 where they effectively raised the white flag and said, we're in big trouble, we need some help. So a consortium of of investment banks, again, all the big names you would have heard of, you know, Goldman, JP Morgan, I think some of the big commercial banks possibly you can't quite recall, sat down with the Federal Reserve, so the, the, effectively the central bank in the US to put together a bailout. And they injected $3.65 billion into LTCM in September 1998 to stop that sort of contagion and systematic risk, right, where the problems that one fund is having start spreading to other parts of the market or other funds or, you know, banks, et cetera, who might be heavily exposed in lending to LTCM at the time. Is that, that making sense? It is, but I just wanted to dig deep into what they were actually doing. Now, first of all, we're talking about bonds here. Are we talking about government bonds, corporate bonds, both? Good question. So I guess, I mean, they had a whole bunch of different strategies and some of the areas where they got in trouble were they held Russian debt, for example, which on paper probably at the time provided a really high return, which is what you'd expect because you're taking a heck of a load of risk. We, nobody needs to, you know, to explain why Russia is a dangerous place to invest, even back then. And so you know, a broad bunch of different strategies, but effectively sort of finding assets that were looking like providing very attractive returns, leveraging the hell out of it, trying to offset that risk somehow with some kind of hedge, again, hence the name hedge funds, but without going too much technicality and sort of rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. So the area that I was involved in, I moved to Tokyo in 1996 and spent four years mostly at Deutsche Bank on the convertible bond sales desk dealing with hedge funds like long-term capital management. And so the Japanese convertible bond market was one area where they were quite heavily invested. 
And at the time when convertible bonds became sort of a product, Japan was one of the biggest issuers in the planet, on you know, in the globe. Back in the sort of early to mid 90s, it really was a, a very large market and hence attracting hedge funds into that space. So that was one of the books that they were running. And I don't think that book specifically got into trouble. The, the problems were in other areas, like I mentioned, that they also got in trouble with the Asian currency crisis in 97. So the roots were planted already before things escalated in 1998. I think we might be talking about that next as well, the Asian crisis. So effectively, the bailout meant that you know they had to unwind everything. So it wasn't every single strategy that got in trouble, but it only takes one or two cards to sort of to bring the house down. Does that answer your question? It does, but I just yeah. wanted to dig deep into convertible bonds. <laughs> yes. So presumably a bond, of course, is a loan to someone. You're loaning someone in a bond. Correct. I'm assuming it's going to convert into some sort of asset. Is that how yeah, a convertible so the, bond the, works? Yeah, that's right. Do they still exist, Steve? They do, yeah, absolutely. It's still a, a pretty big active market. So, you know, globally and, yeah, as far as I know, Japan's still a big part of that space. It's been in financial planning land for 15 years in self-employment, but yeah. Is it analogous to a bank hybrid, for example? No, not really, because the main- Okay, no, is, forget forget about that I said yeah, that. <laughs> no. In the sense of converting it is that the bond eventually converts to shares, but it has a built-in call option. So it's a little more flexible and I guess a little more protection as the owner of a bond versus say a hybrid, where if things get really bad with a bank hybrid, you're going to get jammed with stock from the company, you know, the bank that's getting in trouble or whatever, right? In the worst case scenario. The difference with a convertible bond is effectively just to very basic on the derivatives, lessons 101, a call option is, is a right to buy a share at a preset price, right? But it's a right. So you're not forced to buy it. So the convertible bond, let's say Sony issues a convertible bond to raise some money and Sony share price might be at, you know, 800 yen. And the bond might give you the right to buy the shares at a thousand yen. So at the moment it's worthless because why would I buy shares at a thousand yen when you know I can buy them in the market at a hundred? But the idea is that this bond might be issued for five years, and you hope that over time, of course, that Sony shares go from eight hundred yen to the moon, and you're owning this option within the bond, right? Hence the word convertible, because at the moment it's a bond, but sometime in the next five years, if you want to, you can convert it into Sony stock at a thousand yen per share. You're hoping that over those five years, the stock goes to the moon and you've got this effectively really cheap access to Sony shares. Does that make sense in terms of the basic structure? Yeah, very, very good yeah. sense. And so because there's an option attached to the bond, what the hedge funds would do is try to arbitrage that away. And what I mean by that is, again, a different hedge fund in the earlier 90s worked out a way to, to price these bonds. A guy called Ken Griffith from Citadel, which are still around, massive, massive hedge fund. And they're, they're in a couple of these Michael Lewis stories as well, actually, including the last one, the most recent one, you know, the 2010 book on the, on the, the GFC. So effectively, what hedge funds would do is they buy these bonds, they work out what the, or effectively, again, trying to keep it simple, what tended to happen was when the bonds were issued, the, the options, so that call option, were issued at quite cheap levels. And so the opportunity for a hedge fund to make money is to buy the bond and effectively trade the option around within the bond. Again, try not to get too technical in the explanation. But that was effectively, in inverted commas, the arbitrage. For many years, those bonds were issued pretty cheap because the companies are trying to raise money, right? So they're, you know, they're raising this money, they're issuing a bond, eventually it might turn into more stock. In the meantime, you've got this option attached to the bond, which, you know, if, if the stock is moving around a lot, effectively, you can the value of the bond will change because there is an option attached to it. And the value of the option varies with the value of the underlying security to which it converts, which in this case is the Sony shares. And so the hedge funds would buy these, they trade them around, they buy and sell them with each other. Long-term capital was one of the many you know, big name hedge funds that were out there with very large books of these bonds. Wow. Sounds like they were just too smart by half. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> One of those. So yeah. let's go back to that time in 1997 and you're working on the Japanese bond desk. Then you got, I'm presuming, a fax or a phone call or there was a meeting where something was announced. Can you just tell us what it was like that particular day when everyone found out that shit was going down? Yeah, I guess panic. <laughs> It's the world human at the end of the day, right? Even the smartest guys in the room or girls in the room and whether you've got lots of experience or, or limited experience, 
yeah, it's panic, it's fear. Nobody wants to lose money. No one wants to be caught on the other side of that trade when a massive hedge fund that's getting into trouble is trying to wind their book down. So in a way, it was kind of the worst kept secret because we all knew about the bailout. We all knew that they had to you know, sell and unwind. And that created some really good opportunities, right, for those funds and banks on the other side of that trade. But yeah, it was panic, it was fear, the uncertainty. That's how I'd sum it up for sure at that time. And you got to know the head trader for their Japanese book. This is Deutsche Bank or the company that went down? No, so when I was in Deutsche, yeah, but the guy that was one of the, you know, the team that were unwinding the book for, for yeah. the Japanese bond book, yeah, at the time. How was he so, feeling? <laughs> nervous. <laughs> he, had his, he had his work cut out for him, that's for sure. And look, he, he did a good job, right? It's, it was the worst kept secret on the street that, you know, every time someone would ring up for a price, you know, can you show me a bid for whatever, $100 million worth of Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi, you know, 2032 bond, whatever it was. We all knew who it was, right? But you still, the guy had to do his job and keep his sanity. So he did a great job and at Deutsche Bank. I mean, we were one of many, right? We weren't any, again, all the traditional investment bank names that you would care to roll off, they were on his roller deck so to speak. But, you know, we Deutsche Bank, like a lot of the banks, had a strong, you know, big balance sheet so they could make prices for those, you know, for LTCM to sell into. And then part of my role was to lay that off with another client, right? So there were hedge funds on the other side going, great, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. If they didn't panic, right, and say, okay, this is a great buying price, or this is a chance to clean up and, you know, really get some good quality assets on our books. But without panicking, without sort of worrying, okay, well, how much worse is this going to get? How much lower can these prices go, right? It's just like if we're buying or selling a share individually, it's the same kind of emotion, just on a much larger scale. <laughs> Okay, so this was 1998, and there was a crisis a year before in 1997 as well. Tell us about the Asian currency crisis. Yeah, that's right. So it was uh, late 90s, it was a busy time. When isn't it when it comes to markets, I guess? But yeah, the Asian currency crisis was, I guess, more specifically Southeast Asia. So what they call the Asian tigers, you know, Thailand, Taiwan, other countries, South Korea, that sort of area, that geographical area. And it wasn't one thing in particular, but effectively the outcome was a flight out of those currencies. So a bit like the 98 Russian ruble crisis and again, emerging markets, it, they go through cycles, right? And those cycles tend to be a lot more volatile than developed market cycles, although the GFC was an exception because everything got smashed very badly, whether you're in America or Russia or whatever. But the Asian currency crisis was, as it says, a currency crisis and effectively everybody, investors just fleed, right? They just dumped the currencies, dumped the assets in those countries and left. And so that put a huge amount of pressure on those economies, on their banking systems, on their currencies. And I guess for a few main reasons that started happening was very loose banking regulations in a lot of those countries or weak banking systems, overvalued assets, right? So real estate bubbles, stock market bubbles, again, due to easy credit, lots of speculation, fixed exchange rates. So no ability for the Thai bar to adjust, right? To respond to what market forces are doing, generally pegged to the US dollar. So they've taken away one of those main buffers in an economy for when these things are happening. So, you know, all those combination of different things of events at, at different levels in the different countries. But the net effect, as I said, was just everybody was getting out of Asia. And the other problem they had was that a lot of them were heavily indebted. They were big on the export model, right? So like Japan, the economic success story in the 60s and 70s, sort of trying to replicate that. But that's very debt intensive and requires a lot of investment. And where does that money come from overseas? What currencies are borrowed in? Usually US dollars. What happens when your currency starts devaluing, i.e. the Thai baht will pick on Thailand again, is that it gets harder and harder to, you know, you need more of your Thai baht obviously to go and convert to US dollars to pay your debtors back. So it was just, again, like a house of cards and long-term capital management who we were talking about earlier, they also had investments in these areas. So their 98 crisis didn't just start in 98, it was building up over time. So in this case, we're not talking bonds, we're talking about currency. So is that foreign exchange, forex markets? Is yes. that the sort of thing we're talking exactly about? Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at the end of the day, the currency is a mechanism, right, to not only, but in financial sense with these kind of things. Because if you want to buy property in Bangkok or shares in Taiwan, you've got to first go through the currency to get those assets. And then in reverse, if you want to get out, it's a two-step process. A, you've got to sell in local currency. And B, you then got to sell the local currency, if that makes sense. And therefore, 
that's the funnel, right, for stress and risk and contagion and everything else. It, it all ends up going through the currency because investors want to get their money out of that particular country or area or risk. So that's where it was most amplified in the currency markets. And what was the path of the contagion? <laughs> Did it get into convertible bonds as well? Yeah, look, great question. And that's the thing with contagion in general is it's not the crappy assets, excuse my French, that I mean, yeah, they get in trouble, but generally it becomes a liquidity vacuum. And this is what we saw a lot on the trading desk, and it still happens today, right? A liquidity. We, that's an interesting concept, a liquidity vacuum, which yes. means people aren't buying or selling. Is that the There's, case? Yeah, we're usually not buying, right? Because usually liquidity vacuum, like good news takes, takes care of itself. So when things are going well, you don't usually see too many issues trying to buy more, but it's when things are going bad, everybody's running for the exits and there aren't any buyers. And hence, you know, the word crisis. And generally where that evolves is in the less liquid markets to start with, right? Because that's usually where the problems start. And because they're less liquid, you have less pricing transparency, all of a sudden momentum builds and prices are gapping down, right? Whatever that asset is. And hey, panic sets in and then funds go under and you know, all these things we've been talking about time and time again, it happens. Just, you know, pick it's the a, asset. It's a race right? to the exits, isn't it? Exactly right. But if there's no buyers, how do you exit? So what happens with contagion is, and systematic risk, again, sort of slightly different sides of the coin, but the economic impact can be the same, is the contagion is the spreading of that selling to good quality liquid assets. And so working in Japan at the time, what we saw was, okay, there's nothing wrong with the Japanese convertible bond market. It's stable and it's orderly. But those funds that are getting into trouble with their other Asian assets have to raise money, right? No matter what, they've got their bankers calling them saying, you've got to pay, you've got a logical lateral, right? You guys are in way underwater, like the margin call if you're an individual investor. There's a trigger at which the bank's calling you saying, you need to, need to post more stock or you need to post more cash. So what do you do if you're a fund in trouble? You raise cash wherever you can. And so you go to an orderly liquid deep market like the Japanese convertible bond market and you sell. And so there's the contagion impact. Because all of a sudden, everyone in that market's going, hold on a sec. You know, there's rumors that XYZ funds in trouble and they're raising money by selling their Japanese convertible bond book or whatever it is. And hence the contagion impact. And then it spreads right through other markets. That makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. So yeah. were equity markets affected by these crises at the time Yeah, they, as well? they would. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at all the indices, there was huge volatility, right? Again, you know, started in Asia, but it was impacting globally. And it's that contagion effect, liquidity. People will get money wherever they can if they're being forced to do so. Good quality assets, whatever they can do to raise money. And hence the panic, you know, it builds and it compounds. So yeah, it's fascinating is not the right word, but it's a, you know, for lack of a better word, it's a fascinating thing to watch, except that if it's your money that's on the line, that's the problem, right? And if there's contagion and systematic risk, everybody is exposed potentially. Hence, like, you know, the, the GFC, et cetera, or the bailouts that were required. Super is one of the most important investments you'll ever make. But how do you know if you're in the best fund for your situation? Head to lifesherpa.com.au to find out more. Life Sherpa, Australia's most affordable online financial advice. So were you like sailors in a storm? <laughs> you, you were just trying to batten down the hatches and hang on to any piece of rope you could find? Is, I think how did it a, feel for you emotionally and personally? Yeah, I think it's a good analogy. I mean, you know, I wasn't directly impacted like my personal wealth, although my job was tied to, and bonuses, whatever, to the success of how we managed our situation on the sales desk and the trading desk. And luckily, we had some really good traders who kept their heads and good risk management, right? So we weren't getting into the trouble that some of our customers were. And again, the, using the Asian crisis as the example, you know, that was part of the problem was the banks there had very weak controls and weak oversight. So it was just, you know, cowboy, right? Wild West. So in terms of steadying the ship, we had some, you know, a good captain and a good executive officer and good navigation systems. So no matter how bad the storm, we had a plan to get through it to get out. And that was, I think, the, the really important thing. So what does this tell investors about long-term holdings in growth assets? You know, equity markets obviously being the main growth asset that we're all invested in. It's a great question. I think one of the takeaways from most crisis that certainly in my career and lifetime is leverage, right? It can be, is a killer or excessive leverage and poor controls around that. So I think that's because at the end of the day, you're just amplifying whatever you're doing wrong, you're amplifying it, right? And when I say wrong, you're losing money. 
and you're leveraging, you're just amplifying those returns or those losses. So it can it's a very slippery slope, right? You, it can quickly go bad very fast. And again, if word gets out that there's someone in trouble, then everybody runs away. Nobody's going to show you a bid, right? Nobody's going to buy those bonds off you or the shares or whatever. So maybe that's less of an issue for our listeners right? because we don't, I mean, some listeners might or they might they might use CFDs or they might have a margin loan. Well, they're um, tempted. They're tempted by, by it. I mean, there's a lot of advertising out there that's saying, oh, you know, yeah. go to CFDs or, you know, here's yeah, an absolutely. option strategy that will make you lots of money. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, right? That's We're all after the golden ticket or the golden goose. And I think if it's managed well, it can be successful. And if you reverse that and think about what do most Australians have the big biggest leverage in, what would it be? Our homes. <laughs> there you go. And you, you'd argue that's been successful. You know, by every measure globally, we've got the most expensive houses in the world or one of the, the top countries. So that's an example if you want to say, it's, well, that's kind of leverage managed well, right? But the difference is the price of, of your house isn't displayed on a screen every day. And, you know, it's hard to know exactly where you're at. And also the banks won't lend you more than what the house is worth. In fact, they won't lend you more than usually, what, 80%, whereas a hedge fund- oh, on, a bank, on a bank valuation, which is lower to start with. <laughs> there you go. So there's all those built-in, you know, buffers, safety nets, haircuts, whatever you want to call it. But in some of the things we've been talking about, either they existed and they weren't followed or they didn't exist. So I think, yeah, with growth assets, if it's done well, then it does, and you've got the right horizon and the right, and some kind of process and a system, which is what, you know, again, what Ting looks at and, and what we study with, with our panel and, and services we look at, it can work well, right? But I think the takeaway from, again, these crises is, is that even the smartest people in the room sometimes get it wrong, right? And that's the thing, because at the end of the day, they're still human. We're still sitting around that campfire, you know, four million years ago, looking out for the tiger out in the dark there. And that hasn't changed, right? The programming of the brain. Whether you've got a you know Nobel laureate or you've run a bond desk for 20 years, at the end of the day, it all boils down to those raw emotions. And particularly when it comes to investing, it's fear and greed that are just, you know, tug of war all the time. And I suppose the other takeaway is with growth assets is, again, you want to diversify, right? You know, part of the reason the Asian crisis was a problem because it was concentrated, it was all in the same area. And again, the Russian debt crisis and the ruble crisis, I think the takeaway is you've got to be really mindful of things like geopolitical risk and look at what's happening with Russia right now, for example. So I think their takeaways about investing in long-term growth assets, for sure, those kind of things. So it sounds like part of the lessons of this story, going back to LTCM and being too clever by half, is that simple often beats complex. Exactly right. Yep. I think that's another takeaway that these so called sophisticated hedge funds sometimes, you know, smart, too smart by half, too smart for their own good. Again, how does it boil down for your listeners and our listeners and my clients, et cetera? I think simple is the way to go, right? Because Time and time again, we've seen with these various crises, it's leverage upon leverage and it's trying to arbitrage or whatever it is, and it usually ends up not working. So I think that's a really good rule to stick by as well, right? Not uh, Avoid having too many moving parts and relying on every one of those parts to work at the time they're supposed to, because life doesn't fit into a box like that when you're investing, nor does life anyway, right? So there you go. And you mentioned the recency bias, because if you look at a long-term chart of any equity markets, you know, the main equity markets, you'll see there's this long upward trend. And, you know, these crises that we're talking about and the tech wreck a couple of years later and the global financial crisis and the European currency crisis, they barely show up, don't they? Yeah, exactly right. They're just blips on the long-term chart. But at the time they're happening, they don't feel like blips, right? They feel like life is ending for some people. And again, it's all that... You know, I'm not the the behavioural finance expert, but it's the is it the amygdala or whatever the the different receptors in the brain, and it's it's as if that line's going to come and eat you, right? Apparently, that's yeah, the, the, that's the, same the reptilian the reptilian part of our brains, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you probably had a few guys in the podcast about that, or if not, I'm sure they they should be or they're on your list. But yeah, that's exactly what's going on from my understanding. So, so why do you describe this as a test of mental stamina, having gone through these yourself? Well, it gets back to what we've been talking about. It's the fear and greed, right? Which one's going to beat you? Which one's going to force you to to panic or, or act? And that's the test, right? To Again, if you bring it back to your listeners, individual investors, it's how do you overcome that? You've got to have the stamina to deal with those days when things are going really bad and not making a short-term sort of, you know, irrational decision. It's been plain sailing for a long period of time. I mean, we've already even forgotten about the COVID crash, which seemed to last two weeks mm, or something. Sorry. I think 
a lot of listeners and a lot of people think that this is the way it's always going to be. And it never is, is it? No, it isn't. In other words, I know I say it a lot, but the good news takes care of itself, right? It's just something will come and we don't know what it is, but it'll be panic and there'll be drawdowns of 10 or 20% within the space of a few months. And the last major one was, what was it, late 21 when tech had a, a bit of a sell-off, but we know how that turned out, like talking about blips again, right? Looking back at the almost didn't happen. So yeah, and that's the thing. It's just, you know, the odd time when things happen, it's really, you've got to be prepared for that, right? And whatever your process is, whatever your checklist or you're going out to sale for the day, you go through your safety list in terms of investing, you have to have a plan for that. Just a little bit off topic. This is just something I've been thinking about lately because I get feedback from listeners and questions from listeners and everyone, you know, they start off with a simple ETF strategy, owning some ETFs and, you know, they get the ASX 200 and they maybe get an S&P 500 and then they start thinking about where else that they should be invested in. It's almost like ETFs now are becoming like investing in individual stocks. Oh, should I have a bit of emerging markets? Should I have a bit of bond in here? And suddenly what was passive does become active. Mm. Yeah, look, it's so true. And I think it gets back to simple beating complex. And, you know, the first thing is really just start with a plan, right? And then stick to the plan. So do I want to own ETFs? Do I want to do what's called a satellite approach, which is predominantly index or ETF, passive ETF exposure, but then you're cherry picking a few things around the edge, whether that's individual stocks or some of the thematic ETFs that you mentioned, et cetera. But the worst thing is to chop and change, right? As I've talked to you in previous chats as well, and I'm sure lots of other of your podcasters saying the same thing, you, you've got to try to stick to the plan, right? A, come up with something that's most likely to work through different cycles and B, stick with it through those cycles equals good result at the end. Yeah, you're right. We have talked about this many times, but I don't think it's any problem beating people over the head with not, these tried and true lessons, you know. It's people so need true. to be reminded all the time. All the time, exactly. <laughs> and as a financial advisor, I'm sure you you find that as well, talking to people. That the they all come up with all sorts of, yeah, <laughs> they all come up with harebrained schemes. Simon, what, what do you think about this? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's part of the fun. Okay, so let's talk about Ting, the investing newsletter group, and more recent updates. In fact, remind listeners about what you're doing with this service. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Phil. So the investment newsletter group is effectively a research portal. There's a wealth of stock tip newsletters, investment newsletters available in Australia. And what we found when we started looking at this was there's no sort of independent, unaligned or you know not affiliated research service that looks at how the performance of their recommendations is tracking over time. So we built this about four years ago, and we now cover nine of the, the major investment newsletters out there. And we've been tracking returns for just clocking over three years for seven of those and two for the newest two editions. And the idea is, it's just to help individual you know, self-directed investors or advisors, I guess, to find the right investment service that suits them. And what are the different styles and approaches that you found in these newsletters? Great question. You probably boil it down to two or three different categories. There's sort of the value investing style. There's sort of the quant or, or data investing style where you're looking purely at numbers and sort of mathematical equations around that. And then there's sort of a blended style, which might be, again, fundamental or value style, but using price signals as an overlay for when to enter and exit positions, for example. So the, the broadly, the services we look at would broadly fit into those styles. Some of them, as I said, to a blend. Okay. So since our last chat, you've gotten more newsletters on board and you've also got a few more rankings. And tell us about a couple of the newsletters and how they're panning out. Yep. So we've added two new services, one called Data Analytics, and the other one, Marcus Today, is the name of the service. And I guess why we like these and why they're a bit different to the other seven that were already on our coverage list is they're a bit more what I would call sort of out of the box style or off the shelf. And that means that effectively, you know, they have a bunch of preset or what I would call model portfolios that might have anywhere from usually around 20, 25 stocks in them, or maybe some stocks in ETFs. And you can choose which one you like and effectively track, you know, build it and track their portfolios and, and they'll announce changes either in their weekly or daily, et cetera. And so that might suit investors that really, as I said, they just want something out of the box, right? They don't want to trawl through 50 or different 
50 or Yeah, they want to be told times. what to buy and what to sell and when exactly. to do it. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, we're trying to have a variety of different styles on the portal. So, again, to appeal to as many potential and help as many potential people as possible to find the service that kind of fits the personality or the, the type of investor that they are. And I guess if you like market commentary, they're both pretty heavy on daily reports and podcasts, particularly the markets today. You know, Marcus Padley's quite high profile. So is Mathan as well, who runs deep data analytics, but probably more in the financial space, you know, more from the institutional side originally. So if you like that, then they're good services to subscribe to. There's so much stuff they send out. But again, not everybody does, right? That some people consider that noise and it's just excess information. So it comes down to to personal preference. So those two services are in our matrix. I can't remember if our last shot I mentioned that we have like a, a matrix tool which lists the features, the key features of each investment newsletter or the, you know, the apps. No, that's, is that new? Because I haven't seen that before and we d- yeah, didn't actually it, discuss that. Yeah, I think it might be. So yeah, the third tab on the website, it's just called the Ting Matrix. And so all nine services are listed on a, a Google sheet, which you can, I'm pretty sure you can print that or download it. And it's sort of got all the main areas covered. So what kind of market cap they might look at, other individual stock recommendations, a little bit of a guide to the pricing, links to their websites, what their investment style is, whether they have things like podcasts, extra educational services. So again, the idea is it's just a bird's eye view, right? A quick, so you're not trawling through seven or eight or nine different websites trying to figure out what they offer. We've done that work for you by just sticking it there in the matrix and welcome any feedback, of course, if people, if listeners have anything they'd like to see added or something doesn't look right, or we try to be as accurate as we can, of course. So that would be, again, for someone who's starting out or even just wants to review what they're doing or review the service they've got or look at an alternative, that's a great place to start in the matrix, the comparison tool, comparison matrix. This is a passion project for you, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's just something that has always been of interest to me and we just want to help people to make better investment decisions or a better choice of the service they use to make the investment decisions, I guess, to put it more technically correct. And so we thought, what better way than to start tracking some of the recommendations and see who's actually beating the market? Because how do you know what's really working and what isn't? And you're handing over your hard cash every month or year for access to this information. You would expect a return for that investment. And how's the performance rankings been going? What was the most recent one? So we're about to release July, but the April performance, so in terms of gold medal, which is basically beating the market and beating competitors, Stockpedia, number one at the moment. So they're what we call the gold medal winner. And Intelligent Investor is still doing pretty well. So they're silver, beating the market. The two new services we started tracking, because they've been running for two years, which we've got a slightly different time frame. But so far, Deep Data Analytics and Marcus Today are also both beating the market. So it's nice as there's more services coming onto the portal that are so far beating the market, which is good because it obviously gives your listeners more choice. Yeah. So tell us about the upcoming July release. Yeah, so July for our subscribers, we'll we'll send out the performance update shortly. The other thing, if you go to our website, the two new services that we are covering, Deep Data Analytics and Markets Today, we'll also be shortly releasing what we call a spotlight report, which is a detailed report of the service, you know, the different areas they cover, the types of model portfolios, their investment styles, so much deeper dive than what you see in the comparison matrix and they'll they'll be published in the next month or two there's already a couple up there for there's one up there for stockopedia and that would be useful if those services in particular are of interest to you so keep an eye on that the best way to find out when these are issued is jump on the website ting live t-i-n-g as in the investment newsletter group tinglive.com.au and just scroll to the bottom of the page and just subscribe as it's free and then you'll get all the updates as they come out so that would be the best way to keep an eye on stuff fantastic simon shepherd thanks very much for joining us again and great to hear your war stories my pleasure phil and i realize how old i am when we start talking about this history so at least the memory still works Uh, at least you don't remember the 1987 (laughs) crash (laughs) that's right awesome yeah all these distant memories and great lessons for investors so true thanks simon thanks phil Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future.